Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Howard Yermish, John Atwood, Pat, and new patron, Johan. Everybody welcome in, Johan. Okay. On this episode of DTNS, the CrowdStrike reverberations roll on, but we have some new developments. Asus's handheld gaming PC got a little better, and Trisha Hirschberger helps us prepare the best tech for summer travel. You going to that con? You're going to want to listen to this. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 22nd, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, TV host and streamer, Trish Arschberger. Welcome back. Yay, thank you so much for having me. I love hanging out with y'all. Ah, oh, we love hanging out we with you. Thank you for joining us on a wonderful Monday. Uh, we're going to talk tech. You're, you're headed off to some cons, are you? Oh, San Diego Comic Cons this week. I'm very excited. I leave Wednesday morning. Okay, so uh, if you are also heading, whether it's San Diego Comic-Con, some other con, maybe you're just going on a trip, uh, we're going to get some travel tech tips from Trish for you. But first, let's start with the quick hits. Samsung announced it will no longer pre-install the Samsung Messages app on Galaxy devices, encouraging users to use Google Messages. Google Messages has been the default since 2022, but Samsung Messages was still installed as an alternative. For now, Samsung Messages still available to download in the Galaxy Store. The UK's National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children charity says that Apple reports far fewer cases to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children last year than other tech companies. Companies are required to pass along any possible cases to the NCMEC. The charity says Apple reported 267 cases, while Google reported 1.47 million and Meta reported 30.6 million. TikTok, X, Snapchat, Xbox, and PlayStation also are said to have reported more cases. Apple's messages are end-to-end -end encrypted, but if you want to compare that to WhatsApp, which is also end-to-end -end encrypted, WhatsApp reported 1.4 million cases in 2023. Apple did develop a plan in 2021 to scan images before upload to catch these kinds of cases, but canceled the program after concerns about privacy and protests from digital rights advocates. Reddit has reached deals with major sports leagues like the NFL, NBA, and MLB to show game highlights and behind-the-scenes videos, as well as host Ask Me Anything sessions with some of the players. The information sources say in exchange, the leagues will get a share of the advertising revenue that Reddit generates from the content with ads alongside these videos. Twitter had a similar deal, which ended back in 2022. Reuters reports that NVIDIA is modifying a version of its Blackwell chip so it can be exported to China without violating U.S. export restrictions. Right now, the chip is being referred to as the B20, and NVIDIA is reportedly working with China's Inspire to launch the chip. NVIDIA makes a lot of revenue selling chips to Chinese companies, so it keeps pushing to figure out how to do that without breaking U.S. rules. And the U.S. keeps tweaking its rules to stop Chinese companies from getting more powerful AI chips. Android Authority notes in the latest Android 15 Beta 4 that there are strings referencing satellite connectivity called Pixel Satellite SOS. This implies that users of at least some Pixel models, most likely the forthcoming Pixel 9, might get a free satellite emergency service. The string reads, quote, to use Satellite SOS, Google Messages must be your default SMS app. Satellite SOS is included at no charge for two years. With the two being in brackets mean that it might be a placeholder of some kind? Hard to say. Mm. Uh, the Google Pixel announcement is scheduled for Tuesday, August 13th, and we'll probably know a lot more then. Yep, sounds like it. All right, I know a lot of you are still digging out from the reverberations of that uh, CrowdStrike Falcon bug. Delta Airlines is one of them, uh, still feeling the effects. I think they canceled something like 600 flights today on Monday. Uh we still don't have a full explanation of how this bug slipped through testing, but we do have some follow-ups since we covered it on Friday. So uh, first of all, Microsoft posted Saturday that less than 1% of Windows machines were affected by the bug. That's still 8.5 million machines. And just goes uh, to show you how many Windows machines there are out there. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a 100 times 8.5 million, apparently. That's a lot of Windows machines. Also, um, it's, it's where they are, right? 
like it's it's only one percent of the machines, but they were in some very critical uh, necessary systems. Microsoft spokesperson told the Wall Street Journal that a European Commission decision in 2009 requires them to give security companies the same level of access to the kernel that Microsoft gives its own Windows Defender product. So they're they're basically saying CrowdStrike wouldn't have had kernel access, and you wouldn't have had this problem if we were allowed to not give them kernel access, but the EC requires that we give them the same access. Of course, the other thing they could do is not give themselves access and then not give everybody access, but uh, they're not going to do that. So a lot of people thought this was Microsoft blaming the European Union. I just take it as an explanation of like, yeah, we wouldn't have had a kernel problem if we didn't give them access, but this rule kind of makes it so we have to give them access. Uh, Paul Thorat uh, had a well-crafted piece pointing that out. And also, you tell me, both of you, whether you think this is a distinction without a difference. He made a point of saying it's not a blue screen of death. Blue screen of death is is when the system crashes and you get the blue screen with the big error message. This is just a blue screen <laughs> that says recovery, and those are different things. Blue screen of death means Microsoft Windows crashed. The recovery means, oh, there was a problem that sent us into recovery mode. I mean, I think it's... It's a it's a valid point. I feel like a lot of people are like, well, it felt like death to me. So blue screen yeah. of death is more of a term that we use rather than <laughs> term a specific of way that it died. I mean, if it goes into recovery, you're probably in like ultimate end game mode anyway, which is why yeah. it shares that it feels like blue screen of death. Whether it's technically like the error we're shutting down or the error something's wrong, we need to recover. Both are not great. They're not. They're not. I think Paul's a point, and I actually agree with him on this, is that blue screen of death does make people think it's Microsoft's issue. Uh, and while Microsoft has plenty of issues, I'm not trying to let them off the hook for that. Uh, this is not their issue. The, and CrowdStrike takes full responsibility for it. Uh, so uh, I, I, I get where he's coming from. Uh, there was also uh, several emails from folks uh, making fun of the fact that Southwest Airlines did not get affected by the CrowdStrike bug, not only because it doesn't use CrowdStrike. I mean, if you were using an alternate provider, CrowdStrike isn't the only provider of this kind of service, then you wouldn't have been affected. But because Southwest Airlines, for some of their reservation systems, and not its entire network, but for some of its reservation systems, apparently still uses Windows 3.1 and, and Windows 95 in a few cases. Yes, I saw you know, this I, too. I would chuckle uh, unless I was flying Southwest over the weekend, and then I would say, you know what? Sometimes the older systems are the most reliable. <laughs> uh, I, I would hesitate to tout this, because <laughs> something this old is full of all kinds of other vulnerabilities that maybe yeah. aren't being attacked because no one knew they were still using it. <laughs> and now that they do, this could turn out to, to bite them. I also think that these reservation systems are actually pretty hardened and walled off uh, and and all of that. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if it's a badge of honor or not, uh, but it is definitely hilarious. Um Microsoft also released a recovery tool if you are in the trenches and, and looking for uh, something that's easy to put on a USB drive that you can hand out to people and you can boot to the USB drive and automatically repair the bug. Uh, that's going to be useful. Most of you have probably figured this out already by now, but if you didn't, uh, that's good to know. Uh, and here is something that affected my opinion on this because I know a lot of people are rushing to blame CrowdStrike saying, why didn't they test? And I've been in plenty of companies where like, we did test, we just didn't catch it. So I'm, I've been withholding judgment. I'm not letting CrowdStrike off the hook, but I'm saying, let's hear their explanation first. And we're still waiting on it. However, a uh, few people pointed out over the weekend that back in April, there was a CrowdStrike update for Debian servers that caused a crash and failed a reboot, if that sounds familiar. Uh, and that an upgrade to Rocky Linux 9.4 in May, also, if you were using CrowdStrike, uh, caused your server to crash because of a kernel bug. So a couple of very recent, very similar bugs on other operating systems make me start to lean towards, mm, I wonder if there is a problem with their testing after all. Yeah, yeah. I, I, obviously, because it was a Microsoft situation with, with all the Windows machines out there in the world, uh, got a lot of attention and, and disrupted life. 
uh, more than uh, these other issues, uh, some of which uh, you know you may not even have heard of, or you know certainly weren't affected by. But yeah, when there's a pattern, uh, especially not that you know we got we got in April uh, and then a May, now we're in July, and they're all crowd strike related. It starts to kind of look iffy. Yeah, it's it's like, still like, like sure you're you're testing. I'm not saying you're not testing over yeah, at yeah. CrowdStrike. A lot of people work there, but uh, maybe the testing uh, chain of command needs to be further looked at. Yeah, I, I uh, again, I'm I'm trying to to withhold judgment until they have a chance to defend themselves, which uh, is very rare <laughs> these days. And I understand a lot of people, especially if you've been dealing with this crowd strike, not want to giving give them that grace. I totally understand that. Uh, but uh, I have also been in the situation where people guaranteed that my team didn't do something that we absolutely did, and it was just an unusual situation. So I I I am a little empathetic to that. It does three is not. If three makes our human brains think it's everything. Uh, three is not determinative, but it certainly it certainly isn't isn't good. Uh, and all they've said so far is that it was a logic error, which is basically saying it happened in code. Uh, so we really, really haven't gotten any kind of explanation from them yet. They said they will give us one, and I look forward to that. Uh, Trish, I'm curious if you got affected by this at all. Um, I was not personally affected by it, um, but I do have a lot of friends that were kind of stuck in the travel throws during it. Um, and I did see a lot of the conversation online with a lot of people online mistakenly blaming Microsoft for this issue. Yeah. It's really not a Microsoft issue. So I wonder how many CrowdStrike competitors got a little boost in sales over the past couple of days. Oh, yeah. If you start looking at the financial news, uh, there's <laughs> there's a there's a beating in CrowdStrike stock. Uh, and I'm sure there's a little bit of uplift uh, in some competitors as well. So, just, uh, uh, you know, before we move on, there was a uh... A funny tweet I saw, or I'm sorry, a post on X that I saw yesterday uh, that uh, because there was some news, there was some Sunday news in the world, uh, certainly in the U.S. Uh, yesterday afternoon, and someone said, boy, CrowdStrike's PR department <laughs> <laughs> really, got, really got a bone this weekend, huh? CrowdStrike on Friday was like, the president would just have to announce he's not running for re-election for us to get out of this one. Yeah, Ding. wouldn't that be lucky timing? Yeah. Well, CrowdStrike, you're not off the hook. We still want that explanation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Asus launched its portable gaming device, ROG Ally, just over a year ago. And its successor is called the ROG Ally X, and it's shipping today for $800. The X comes with a 7-inch, 120 hertz, 1080p display. It also has 24 gigabytes of memory, uh, one terabyte of user upgrade upgradable NVMe storage. Asus's Armory Crate SE software is the primary game launcher and hub for all installed games from platforms like Steam and, and the Epic Game Store. Users can also adjust joystick LEDs and make some other setting changes like their gamepad profiles. And the reviews are out. Obviously, it was an embargoed thing. Some people had early units. Um, so uh, we got some write-ups from TechCrunch and Windows Central and PC World and the like. Uh, the, the, the folks had plenty of good things and some not so good things to say about the the ROG Ally X. So let's talk about the pros. Uh, they said, in general, comfortable to hold. Uh, the one terabyte of storage is double that of the first Ally. So that's, that's a welcome addition. Games run smoothly for the most part. Uh, 80 watt hour battery life better than uh, its uh, predecessor, although still not great, but definitely better. Um, and now has two USB-C ports. Uh, one is USB 4, compatible with Thunderbolt 4 devices. That just is something that's a welcome change for a lot of folks. But there are some cons. Um, the Armory Crate SE software game launcher and command center are OK, definitely buggy. Uh, there are reports of some crashes. Um, the D-pad <laughs> has been described uh, by um, uh, TechCrunch is kind of mushy. Um, and view and menu buttons can be hard to reach. Uh, not having a touchpad makes it harder to take advantage of having full windows. Um, some frame rate compromises for AAA games. And, and it's pricey if you are comparing it to other portables that aren't exactly the same spec-wise, but in the same category. Now, Trisha, I know you've, you've, got, the, you've got the first gen uh, ROG Ally, and, and you know, I know you like it. So do any of these upgrades make you want to upgrade yourself? Uh, so it's not so much the tech upgrades, because honestly, a lot of the tech is pretty similar from the Ally to the Ally X. 
The biggest thing that would make me think about upgrading is, I'll be honest, the vents here at the top of the ROG Ally get, get a little toasty. And by a little toasty, I mean, don't grab it by the top if you've been gaming mm. for like an hour or so. Um, and I had heard that for some people, it getting so warm there actually affected the micro SD slot, which is right here for your expandable mm. storage. And I've heard that in the new Ally X, which I got a chance of very briefly to see at Computex this year, but didn't really get a chance to like spend any time with. I've heard that the heat issues and then therefore the micro SD issues, that has been mostly solved. So that's awesome. That is the one thing that I would say would probably make me think about switching. But I love the Ally that I have and they're expensive. So I don't know that there's enough there to get me to upgrade. Um, like the better battery life, honestly, you get better performance when it's plugged in anyway. And unlike a gaming laptop, you can plug this in on an airplane. This will work mm. with airplane outlets and just a USB-C, which is great. Um, because when you're plugged in, you get the performance mode and it's, it's just much better in turbo. Um, so battery life doesn't really matter to me because I'm going to play with it plugged in on an airplane anyway. And primarily this is my airplane device and storage. I don't really care because there's the expandable storage. I'm just going to mm. pop a micro SD in there. Uh, so I don't know that there's enough there to get me to upgrade at this point. But if you don't have an ally, this is my favorite of the handheld gaming PCs. I think it feels really comfy in hand. It runs all my games beautifully. And while I totally agree that Armor Crate, the software, can be a little buggy, I don't use it. That's <laughs> I don't use it. I just run full Windows. And the touch screen, mm -hmm. not having a touchpad doesn't bug me at all because I just touch screen it. Using the touch screen in full windows is very easy for me to navigate as a PC gamer. If you're not natively a PC gamer and you're not familiar with Windows 11 and how that works in terms of downloading different software companies, launchers and that kind of stuff, I could see it being confusing. The UI is just definitely not as seamless as it is on other handheld gaming PCs. But because I'm familiar with gaming PCs in general, that's not really an obstacle for me. I could see where it would be for others though. That explains why I was seeing mixed reports on that. Some people were like, yeah, Windows in full mode, just you 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 definitely need a touchscreen to do it. And other people were like, eh, and the touchscreen would be nice, but you know, weren't weren't as bothered. It's probably the familiarity with it. But by and large, what you said about more comfortable holding seems to be the consensus is like the new one is easier to keep in your hands, but if you have the old one, you probably don't need to upgrade. Yeah. Sarah, have you played with it at all? Have not, no, uh, not, uh, and uh, haven't even held one in person. Now, just because <laughs> Trisha and I, you and I have spent quite a bit of time in person together, and I know we're both, you know, smaller sized humans, it looks so big in, in your hands to me, which is always the issue I have with tech in general. If something is too big, I just feel like it's a little unwieldy. But then with gaming, it's, it's, it's a little different, you know, what you, you're using the touchscreen here and there. Um, but then when you have your, I don't know, hands comfortably using the buttons that you need, maybe it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to quickly hold up my ally and my switch side by side. So yeah, so it's remarkably see. larger. So it is. Well, I guess maybe it's not that much larger. But some, I don't think it looks... remarkably larger at all. Like yeah. the, some of the really early handheld gaming PC prototypes were big and heavy. Yeah. And like I'm not taking that with me. This I guess I guess larger and up. and somewhat thicker makes it seem bulkier. Yeah. But a bit. you know, it's again, yeah, it's it's thicker. not a, it's not a you know a small smartphone either. So. Right. Oh, it's definitely not a smartphone, but I'm used to traveling and gaming with a gaming laptop, which battery life on those are also abysmal. And you cannot plug them into airplane outlets if they have a dedicated GPU. You're just out of luck. You're gaming for 90 minutes or whatever your gaming laptop will get you. And then you're doing something else for the rest of your flight. So right. I love it. I'm a big fan. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, 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 one last question before we move off of this. Uh, do you think this has the chance to become a more mainstream form factor? Or is it going to stay as a niche, like people who love it, like yourself, love it kind of situation? I think people who are predominantly PC gamers. So when you're really getting into that PC gamer enthusiast market, I do think that in the future, we'll see more people go from gaming laptop to something like this specifically for gaming. Now, that being said, a gaming laptop can do work, too. So there's certainly an argument to be made for sticking with the laptop. Um, but strategically for gaming on the go, I prefer this to a gaming laptop. 
It's not going to win over your console gamers. I don't, yeah. I, I don't know about that. So we're getting there. We just need to get that form factor just a little closer and then more people could pick it up. Thank you, Trish. That's awesome. Uh, real quickly, too, CR Poll just pointed out in our YouTube chat uh, that Intel has announced uh, it has found the root cause of crashing issues that plagued its CPUs and a microcode fix coming by mid-August. You can find uh, the breaking news on Tom's hardware as well if you want more details about that. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you can find out in our Discord, too, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, it's summer uh, and you're traveling, at least when the CrowdStrike bug lets you. But uh, whether you're headed to the beach or your favorite fan convention, maybe you're headed to San Diego Comic-Con, packing the right tech gear is essential to keep yourself from losing your mind. Uh, Trish, you travel quite a bit. Uh, what are the tech things you can recommend that will make travel just that much less stressful? All right. Well, I put together a list of the things that I'm taking to San Diego Comic-Con. I'm leaving this week. But I think that these are some tech must-haves regardless of where you're traveling. So again, I'm going to try to focus on like the must-haves more so than the fun-haves, like the gotcha. ROG Ally. Um, number one for me, anytime I travel, is a portable battery pack, at least 10,000 milliamps. You can get them so inexpensively now. And I mean, if you're running around a convention or you're at a beach all day or something like that, you're probably not going to be near an outlet. And you may be in an area that does not have great uh, cell reception, meaning that your phone's looking for that all day, right? You're gonna run out of juice quick, especially if you're using it for your navigation or Google Translate, if you're traveling internationally, bring at least one 10,000 milliamp battery pack. So that's a number one on my list. Um, you will need a smartphone. Uh, I like to keep two smartphones if possible. Mm -hmm. uh, one smartphone for communicating and navigating in Google Translate, and then, either a second smartphone for content capture. And I mean, even for folks out there that aren't creators by trade, you probably want to take photos and videos on your vacation or on your trip, right? To remember stuff by. So if you can do two phones, that's great to separate them. If you can't, again, I point back to number one, bring that battery pack. Bring that battery, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's going to go fast. Um, and then if you really want to up your content capture game, if you're like, Trisha, I need the best of the best photos and videos from my trip, then I either bring with me the DJI Osmo Pocket, which I have the Gen 2 that I travel with, that has a little like clip on wireless mic. And then I just capture all my content with this little gadget, which is great. It takes photos and videos or new for Comic-Con this year. And I'm interested to know if either of you have ever tried these, the Meta Ray-Ban glasses. So I just Tom's got the first gen. Yeah, way. I've got the first gen, but they're they're pretty low res. Uh, I heard the second gen's much better. So they look pretty much like traditional glasses. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the AR glasses in the early years looked really funky, um, but this will capture video and photo and audio pretty well, from what I've heard from my tech reviewer friends. And I mean, it's certainly uh, less conspicuous than running around with your phone out capturing everything. Yeah, yeah. Like, Boop -boop. You know, if I, I know, you know, for anybody watching the video feed, I know that these are the meta Ray-Bans because you're telling me, I don't think I would notice that right away. Yeah. If you were, Especially if we were just, those... if I was like, hey, Trisha, it's so good to see you. Wow. How you been? Love your glasses. Cause they're cute. Yeah. They're, those they're nice thicker rim glasses are, are pretty common these days too. So the fact yeah. that the rims are thick doesn't even strike me as it, unusual it doesn't, at all. Yeah. I mean, I, and even if I did know what they were, I don't think they look bad. I think no. they look pretty nice. Yeah. I think yeah. they look pretty great. So like I said, for those of you that are like, I really want to up my photo and video game. I would either go with something that's a very small, lightweight vlogging camera like the DJI Osmo Pocket, or you could really be stealthy and go with the Meta Ray-Bans, which is what I'm going to try this year for SDCC. Um, and again, shout out to Meta for sending these to me for my SDCC coverage. It'll be fun. Um, and then if you're going somewhere that's hot, a lot of conventions are hot, but a lot of trips you may be traveling in general are hot. Uh, those neck fans that they sell on Amazon, they sell them on a lot of different retail sites. They are inexpensive. You can get one for around $20. And I am always pleasantly surprised when I'm sent one of these to review that it actually cools me down. It looks a little Do they silly. really work? Really? They do. They work. It's so surprising to me because I thought yeah. it was going to be junk. And then every time I've tried them, I'm like, this actually keeps me cooler. So in a pinch. I mean, and huh. you don't have to 
hold on to it, right? Yeah, because I've had the ones that you hold in front of you, and they're they're not bad. They're, there's a nice <laughs> breeze, but it's an, annoying because you have to hold it. When you first said neck fan, yeah, I I I didn't think of something that you were holding with your hand, although a lot of people do use those. But I was thinking of something that had like you know propellers. I thought, well, that's going to be messy, especially with people who have longer <laughs> hair. But I mean, one of the reasons that I, uh, especially this time of year, almost never wear my hair down is because my neck gets hot. It's yeah. like the place that I want to be cool. And hair, again, going back to hair or I don't know, certain clothing, um, it, a, a cool neck can really go a long way. Yeah. It and it may help. scream tourist, but you'll be cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially if you're like hiking through the jungle or something. At that point, I don't care if I look like a tourist. I mean, or if someone's be. like, you're a tourist, I'm like, I'm cool, though. And <laughs> I'm a cool important. tourist, literally. Also, so, you know, when you tour places, that's what you are. Mm. It is. You know, but, sometimes you, know, you just again, are a tourist. That's, you know, If you want to blend thing. in, there are some lighter option things you can do. And then finally, uh, if you're going somewhere where you think you're going to need to be waiting in line, whether it's for sightseeing or for panels or whatnot, bringing something tiny that can help to keep you occupied, like as small as a pair of buds, maybe to listen yeah. to a podcast or your favorite music or something like that. That's awesome. And or a Kindle for my Comic-Con goers, you can get digital comics on your Kindle and you could just be reading comics in line while you're waiting for your panel to start. Perfect. Or something like that. Yeah. Brush up on the topic of the panel you're about to enter into. Sure. <laughs> Earbuds sure. are a hundred percent essential for me. Like, you know, sitting around in an airport, listen to podcasts on the plane, watching some shows, et cetera. Like you got to have those. I'm I'm a hundred percent with you there. And the DJI Osmo takes really good video. It, that gimbal is amazing. It's stability, right? It's so good. I have the two, even though I know the three is out now and everyone says the three is amazing, but I will tell you all my CES coverage was done with the Osmo pocket two. And mm -hmm. it, it consistently gets compliments uh, on both the audio and video quality. So I can only imagine the three is even better in comparison. Is it something you could use for live streaming, like a show like this, or is it portable only? I mean, I guess you could use... I mean, you could do anything, right? But yeah, yeah it's not really meant for that. Yeah, Make right. it happen if you wanted to, but mostly you're recording to a micro SD card on Got here. it. Um, but yeah, these are all my picks for lightweight things that'll be small in your bag that can make all the difference for your summer tech travel needs. Indeed. Thank you, Trisha Hirschberger. I think you just made everyone a little cooler in multiple ways, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Bob, who said, regarding the deal that gives Verizon subscribers Netflix free for a year, we talked about this with Charlotte Henry in last Thursday's show, if they subscribe to Peacock for a year, Bob says, my question is, do you know if the deal is only for newcomers to Netflix, like people who just can't have had a Netflix account already to use this deal? That would limit on who could use it, but they'd still get a lot of publicity for offering a great deal. Bob says, this may be obvious, but since it wasn't mentioned, I was wondering. Yeah, I looked it up uh, and I sent this to, to Bob already. Uh, Verizon is putting this in a hub of offers. This has become a new thing for for mobile carriers around the world where they, they give you lots of different offers. So if you're a Verizon person, uh, you need to go to the Plus Play hub and then you can add uh, Peacock pay for it for a year and you get the Netflix for free for a year. So you don't have to be a new subscriber. It is something for everyone. But you do have to well, be thanks. a subscriber of some sort. Thanks, Bob, for the question. Glad we could answer it. Uh, Bob also says uh, he goes back to listening to us from the Twit Cottage days. So Aww, thanks, Bob. Good to have you, Bob. Thanks for your support over the years. Uh, thanks to you, Trisha Hirschberger, for being with us, making us cooler. Um, hope you have fun at Comic-Con. But um, besides Comic-Con coverage, which I'm sure there'll be a lot of, where can people find your work? Oh, you can find me at twitch.tv slash Trisha Hirschberger. That's where I am every day that I'm not filming on set. Uh, otherwise, online, I'm that girl Trish with no I in the girl on all the stuff. Patrons, we give you more show. Uh, there's an RSS feed you can get right from patreon.com slash DTNS. It has no ads, and it continues the conversation today. Now that we've talked travel gear, we're going to talk about how we've used it. Uh, Trish, Sarah, Roger, and I are all going to talk about some of our experiences with tech while traveling, both old and new. Uh, stick around. If you're watching live, share yours in the chat.
Just a reminder, we do the show live and you can catch it Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow talking pet health tech with Kate Lawrence joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>